the kingdom agenda. Good morning, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. And to those of you that are viewing all around the globe this morning, we want to welcome you to our online worship experience. And we want to welcome those of you that are joining us in the house. OCBF, can you make some noise this morning? There's life in the house. The life of God is here with us. And we pray that it's with you this morning. Listen, Hebrews 12, 29 says this, that God is a consuming fire, and he's come to take over this morning. So we pray that you're ministered to. Dr. Evans has a word this morning, I know from the Lord. And so we want you to engage. We want you to stand up and worship and pray with us, praise God with us. And I want to make sure that you also know that at the end of service, we're going to have communion. So go ahead and get your juice, crackers, water, whatever you need so that you can join us in that time at the end of service. But right now is a special time where we roll out the red carpet for the king of glory to come in the room because how can we be kingdom without a king? We need Jesus in the room. Can you stand to your feet, church? Let's bless the Lord. Our God is great. Come on, OCBF. Let's offer worship to the Lord this morning. Put those hands together.
to men whereby we must be saved and it is the name of Jesus. I said it is the name of Jesus. we sing in Jesus name this morning come on clap those hands you can rock from side to side it's okay in his presence David dance so we can dance this morning
Wow. Looks like y'all ready to shout it out. Well, it's good to see you. I think this is our biggest crowd yet, so it keeps growing a little bit more every week. As folk feel a little safer, a little uh, more secure, we're doing our part by uh, still, still asking for masks, and doing social distancing because we want you to feel safe, but uh, we want to let folks know we still have some room for more. And, uh, and now it's time to leave Bedside Baptist and Mattress Methodist and uh, I know it's real convenient to stay in your pajamas and look at the screen or the, or the uh, TV or, the, or whatever device you're using. But it's time to begin to gather slowly, deliberately, purposefully. But it's time to be in the house together. And we're certainly glad that, to have you and all who will be part of this uh, uh, online experience as well. But it always uh, is good to be in the house with, with the family. And uh, you are precious people to me and to each other, and most of all to the Lord. So we're, we're grateful to be with you today. We want to let you know that uh, two weeks from now is the uh, Resurrection Weekend. And of course, that's when we recognize and celebrate the greatest event in human history, and that is Jesus' resurrection from the dead and what it means to us. We have a special uh, person leading us in worship and praise that Sunday. Fred Hammond will be with us, and he's going to be leading us in worship. So we want the place full, or as full as we can safely make it, on that Sunday at uh, 1030 in the morning. But we also want to use this as a time of special outreach. So I'm going to invite you to invite your family and friends who are non-Christians, or nominal Christians, as we will use that opportunity since, as I've said, even Satan goes to church on Easter. So folks will go to church or at least uh, connect with church uh, that time of year in, in a special way. And so we use that as an opportunity every year to reach out with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus Christ. So I want you to all be missionaries, whether it's bringing them with you here or having them be online with you. That's uh, two weeks from this weekend, the live service on Saturday at 10.30, and then, of course, online on Sunday at, uh, at 10 o'clock. So please uh, uh, be a missionary. Reach out and say, join me for worship. Let's hear the ministry and music of Fred Hammond and for the word, and uh, uh, let's, let's see many people uh, one to Christ. Uh, this this Easter time, people are so messed up. They need hope somewhere, so <laughs> so we want to make our contribution to that. As things are moving and we move forward to see how God wants to do a divine reset. Whenever God allows a cataclysmic event, is because He's reordering something. He's reshaping something. Of course, the biggest reshape is the return of Jesus Christ. Short of that, he wants to bring us into a clearer, better proximity to himself. So as we look at this as a church, as a ministry, we want to make sure we're hearing his voice clearly uh, to uh, reset ourselves, reset our programs, we reset our priorities, reset any structural resetting that has to happen so that we are even more effective in the days to come because uh, the way things are looking people are going to become more and more desperate and we want to be here to love them to show them com compassion and to communicate the truth and so uh, uh, your faithfulness as we pick back up and you get back involved in ministry because I miss my choir behind me my choir is not behind me so I need my choir back okay uh, I want uh, those in the Metroplex to know that you can uh, apply for membership online. You can go online, ocbfchurch.org forward slash membership, and find out about our online membership process. Every first Sunday we offer that, and uh, you can find out how you can become a part of this church. If you want to be a kingdom disciple who is a kingdom servant that makes a kingdom impact, that's what we are 
doing, and we try to do that together. We try to experience God together here, and if you can find out about our, our membership class uh, by uh, going uh, online. So please do that, and you can uh, register for our next class, uh, which is right around the corner. Well, uh, we, are, um, we are pressing on in ministry. We're pressing on in loving people and caring for people and serving people because we are saved to serve, not served to save to sit. And I think every week you should ask yourself a question, who have I served this week? Who have I served this week? Who have I helped? Who have I prayed with? Who have I encouraged? Because servants can come in a lot of different ways. Some people just need an encouraging word, a, an email, a phone call uh, to lift their spirits, a visit appropriately done. Uh, anything we can do to touch, to touch another life right now, is, especially right now, is critical. Not only individually, but of course, as a church, uh, we are putting the finalizing touches on expanding our homeless outreach. The unsheltered are the most vulnerable of all in our community. And uh, in light of the pandemic and everything, the unsheltered have expanded exponentially. And so we want to be where the need is. And uh, so we're doing some things there. So you'll be hearing about things. We're cutting back over here so we can major over here where we need to major, uh, starting with our flock and then expanding beyond to our community. So so we, we want to be known for not the buildings, not the land. We want to be known for the service. Now, if those help us serve, better fine, but that's what we want to be known as. Servants. So keep that in mind. The Bible says that we are saved to serve, okay? Your giving helps us to do that collectively. Uh, through your tithes and thanksgiving offering, faithfulness to God through the church so that we can be hands and feet together to touch your life, your family's life, and the life of the community in which we serve. And now with things being online, we're getting stuff from all over the country, people hurting and struggling and asking for prayer, and loved ones sick or lost, or it's just one thing after another. So the Church of Jesus Christ is needed more than ever before. But well, we can't be, we're only one church uh, for our local ministry, but we want to have as big an impact as God will allow us to have. So let's pray to that effect right now. Father, I bring before you this worship experience, the songs, the prayer, the praise, the preaching. May all of that wrap around to your good name and your good glory. Dear Lord, you have allowed all that is happening to us right now. May we not be so focused on the circumstances that we miss the Lord in the midst of the circumstances. As we look at your word, as we read it each day, as we meditate on you each day, as we pray and praise in our own personal worship service each day. May you touch us with your presence. May we not depend on a service once a week to get us through the week, but to launch us into the week in staying in contact with you through your word. So keep us focused on you and show your favor to every man, woman, boy, and girl to whom we get to minister in person or online. Thank you for those who are still ministering to the children and the youth online. And we want to make sure, Lord, that we are doing your bidding your way. So receive the rest of our worship as we sing, even with masks on, as we praise, as we give, as we do all of this. Be glorified in Jesus' name. All God's people said. Amen. We confess our love for the Lord this morning. Simply say, Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah. Father, we honor you. We love you. Oh, 
Yes, we love you. Sing to the Father this morning. And oh, how we love you. Oh, say you are the one. You are the our hearts adore. That's it. Even with your mask on, sing it one more time. To Jesus, we love, we love you. Oh, 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 you, you are the, uh, Say that one more time. You are the one. You are the one. You are the one. I heart to door. Confess it one more time. You are the one. You are the one. Our heart and Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Mm. And he says when he moves with his key, that is with his divine authority, he says when he does that, nobody can shut it. This ought to do something to your gizzard. Right there, right there, right there. Let me tell you what I ought to do with your gizzard. What this means is, when you're using God's keys, people do not have the last say-so. See that? See? We get all shook up about people. Oh, he got the power to let me in or to lock me out. He got the power to raise me or to put me down. He's got the power. She's got the power to fire me or hire me. They got the power. They got all the power. Jesus said, but I got the master key. And when I open the door, I don't care who they are, where they come from, how much they have, what degrees they possess. When I have the key, if I decide to open that door, nobody's going to shut the door I open. And if I decide to lock them up, they're not going to be able to get back in because I'm in charge here. I've got the key to the kingdom. See, we fear the wrong folk. We fear folk because they got a name. We fear folk because they got some money. We fear folk because they got some power. But you are related to the one who's got the key of David. Ultimate authority. Final say so. Dear Lord, speak today as we listen, but not just to our external ears because you said let he that hath an ear let him hear making it clear we can have external ears and still not hear may we hear that we might hearken to the truth in Jesus name Amen on December 20 December 17th 1924 an S-4 submarine was rammed just off of Cape Cod. The submarine began to sink. Forty sailors rushed to the only compartment left with oxygen on the submarine that was sinking. They began to send a code out to the help with a question. Low on oxygen, sinking, they asked, is there any hope? They were in a situation that they could not fix. They were running out of the ability to breathe. They were locked in a tube so they couldn't see whether there was any help available. All they could do was send out a message with a question. 
Is there any hope? When you look at our world today unraveling at warp speed, that would seem to be the appropriate question. Is there any hope? Can this hot mess be fixed? Individuals are asking this question, is there any hope? Will I be able to get back to life as normal? People are arguing about what we could do, what we should do. Do you wear a mask? How many masks do you wear? A single female wants to know, is there any hope that I will ever have a meaningful relationship with a good man? Is there any hope? Couples raise the question, is there any hope for this relationship? Divorce looks like it's the only resolution. Is there any hope? And the culture, is there any hope for racial unity? Is there any hope for political order? Is there any hope for civility to return? Because I don't know about you, but if you look at the lose long enough, you're reminded it's not getting better. And regardless of your political persuasion, it is clear it kind of doesn't matter who's in the White House. Because the calamity continues to unravel. So the question is, is there any hope? And every time it looks like there's a little light, it turns out to be the light of an oncoming train. Because things just revert back to being problematic again. And the question is, is there any hope? I want to call your attention to a passage of Scripture well known by all of us who are acquainted with our Bibles in the book of Ezekiel, the most well-known chapter in the book of Ezekiel. You know it as the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel 37. And that's the question that the prophet has to raise, is there any hope? Let's look at the situation. The hand of the Lord was upon me, verse 1 says. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. We're told at the end of verse 2, and they were very dry. We're told in verse 11, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished, we are completely cut off. He paints a picture of desperation, despair, defeat, disunity. And he says, our hope is gone. We have been cut off. We're cut off from God and we're cut off from each other. He gives him a picture of an ossuary. An ossuary is a coffin. He sees this huge coffin encompassing a whole valley. And the bones were very dry, he says, in other words, it's been this way a long time. They're not just dry, they are very dry. We've been in this stupor for a long time. And the, the bones, he says in the passage, were all disconnected. The biggest, best picture I can give you is a puzzle box. When you see the puzzle box, the pieces are all rambled and disconnected, they don't fit together yet. It does, it's not fitting together. He 
He calls them later on in the chapter an army. So we're looking at a defeated army, an army that can't fight. We're looking at an army that's been beaten, toe up from the flow up. He, he's looking at what he calls in verse 11, the whole house of Israel. In other words, this was a crumbled nation. Israel was the people of God in the Old Testament. The church is the people of God in the New Testament. He says of the Old Testament people of God, we are a defeated culture, a defeated nation. Transposing that to today, I've called this message, Reviving defeated Christians. Because we're supposed to be God's army. But we are full of bones. Dried up for a very long time. Now to set the context for this situation, you have to understand why they are where they are. Why are they in this desperate, defeated situation. They're in Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel is prophesying at a time when Babylon has been used by God to discipline his people. The reason for the discipline is stated in verse 25 of chapter 36. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. You see, what Israel had done is it had bought into the culture and had adopted the values of the secular nations around it and incorporated their values into God's people. I was working on a document the other day and one of the things I was responding to on the document was critical race theory and pros and cons. And one of the cons I brought up, I said, we, it is legitimate to identify racism whether it is in politics or education or culture or law or whatever structural presence it has. But then I went on to say, but it is illegitimate to make it the dominant sin. It is legitimate to deal with the sin. In critical race theory, it becomes the dominant sin through which everything else is filtered. I said it's illegitimate to do that because it is just one of many evil sins. Because the dominant sin in the Bible is one thing, idolatry. Everything can fit under that category of idolatry. And whenever you elevate your race to be the only thing, you've idolized your color. And so now you are against God in the name of race or culture, or class, or you can... In America, we have sophisticated idols, American idols. Idols of pleasure, idols of popularity, idols of notoriety, idols of materialism, even idols of religion, idols of education. Whenever a noun, person, place, thing, or thought is raised to the level that it can compete with or trump with God, that's an idol. Idols will always produce spiritual distance. In other words, once you adopt an idol, it will automatically disconnect you from God. So all through the Bible, you'll see this sin talked about more than any other sin. 
because all other sins can be subsumed in it. He says, I will cleanse you from your idols. An idol is any noun that conflicts with or competes with God. It is worshiping the wrong God, or watch this, worshiping the right God in the wrong way. In other words, coming up with your own ideas to worship the true God. Their idolatry created distance, and their distance created despair. So they're in defeat and despair because their idolatry put them now. And so now the secular world, Babylon, is ruling them. They're, they are defeated in Babylon. Sort of like the church is defeated in America. The secularism of the culture has taken the army of the church and turned us into dry bones. The valley is a low place. Valleys are low places between bigger hills or mountains. So they, they not only defeated, they at the bottom. In the movie Concussion with Will Smith, there's an interesting phrase as they were talking about how the NFL had become so dominant in the culture. And the phrase in the movie was referring to the NFL, we own a day that used to belong to the church. People who will miss church who won't miss a football game. The culture had in, infiltrated the people of God, creating idolatry, which created distance, which led to despair. So the reason why the church is so weak is we have become idolatrous mimics of the culture. Not unique in the culture, but we have been a reflection of the culture. So no wonder we are dry bones. And so this distance had placed God's people, Israel, into a major predicament which causes Ezekiel to hear God raise a question. Here's the question God raises. Verse 3. He said to me, God says to Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? Now, remember the situation of the bones. Bones of dry, distant, despair, defeat, hopeless. In other words, this was an impossible situation. Can these bones live again? And I answer in the verse three, oh Lord God, you know. I don't know if you caught that. God asked Ezekiel to answer the question. You see how bad this situation is, Zeke? Zeke, you know Zeke. You see how, you see how bad this situation is? Can this be fixed? It's a bad situation. Can this be fixed? Ezekiel's answer is, Lord God, you know, don't ask me. Don't ask me. Or put it another way, all he could do is shake his head and go, mm, mm, mm. He says, I can't answer that question. This, this is a hot mess here. This stuff is toe up from the flow up. It's a hot mess. I don't have a human answer, God, to your question. If I were to ask you, how do we fix the church and how does the church then impact the culture? 
I'd have to say, oh God, you know. In other words, don't ask me. Don't ask me because I can't help with that question. It's too messed up. The puzzle has too many pieces. It's too disconnected. I, I, can't, I, I don't, only you know God. Because it's going to take some omniscience to fix this. Because I don't know what politician I can go to. I don't know what cultural institution I can go to. I don't know what personality I can go to. I don't know. And if we would all be honest, when we look at the situation, all around us, we have to say, I don't know. Because this, this, this is bad. Uh, you know, we had the big winter storm in Texas. And the urban alternative, our national ministry, the pipes broke in the ceiling from the sprinkler system. One of our staff decided to go by the office a couple of days later. And the TUA offices were flooded, flooded, lost a lot of the product that we ship out to people and all that stuff. The offices were so up. So I went in to see it just, just the other day. They told me about it, and they showed me pictures, but I went to see, I went to the valley myself. And when I saw the havoc that had been wrought in this building, all I could say was, God, only you know. Because we down to the studs, and I'm not sure these studs can live again. This was a bad situation. He just sees a situation so bad that he doesn't see that they, it can be fixed. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. Or was there? So keep in mind now, we have an unfixable problem. You may have an unfixable problem in your life. I'm sure if I ask Everybody with dry bones in here to raise your hand, there'd be some hands that go up because you're in a situation you can't fix. It's too big. It's too complex. It's out of your control. You can't, you don't, you don't have the, even the get up and go to go get it. I mean, it, you just stuck, discouraged on some level, personally, familiarly, ecclesiastically, or culturally. God then tells them something. Again, he said to me. Now, the first thing he said was, can these bones live? That's the first question. He says, I can't answer that question. Only you, you can answer that question. It's too bad. Again, he says to me, verse 4, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So these bones can still hear. Okay? Because I want you, Ezekiel, to tell the bones to hear the word of the Lord. Let me, let me go a little slower. You tell the bones who are in a bad situation that they can't fix, hear the words of the Lord because now maybe they're ready to listen. See, they've been listening to the word of man. They've been listening to the word of the culture. They've been listening to the word of the of the experts, of the elite. They've been, they've been listening to every other word. So, so now, 
Ezekiel, I want you to prophesy the word of the Lord. Because sometimes you're not ready to listen to God yet until stuff has got bad enough, long enough, deep enough, that you're now willing to pay undivided attention because there's no way out. So now I want these dry bones that have ears to hear the word of the Lord. But notice what he told them to do. He says, prophesy to the bones. Prophecy is a form of preaching, but it is more than just informational disclosure. In other words, it's more than just general sermonizing. It's more than just teaching you a Bible study. The prophets spoke God's will into a specific situation, not a general message. It was targeted. Speak to these dry bones. Prophecy was speaking or foretelling and foretelling what God wanted to happen in a situation that was tied to his revelation. So prophesy is just not a general reading of the Bible or general hearing somebody preach. It is targeted. It is speaking into a situation. That's why the New Testament says despise not prophecy. He's not talking about go to church and hear the preacher. He's saying despise not God's word being spoken into a situation. So one of the things in your own dryness you should ask God for is a prophetic word. Not just a sermon. Now, sometimes a prophetic word can come through a sermon. There have been times people say, well, you were speaking just to me today like I was the only person in the room. So they heard a prophetic word, a rhema word, and not just a general sermon. So despise not prophecy. In fact, ask for it. But it will be the word of the Lord, but it'll be the word of the Lord for your specific scenario, not, not a general word. So I want you to prophesy, speak my word into this situation. So, thus saith the Lord, verse 5, the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter to you that you may come to life. Hmm. Now, they're not alive yet. But do you know how it feels to just hear you will live again? They still dry bones. All they've heard was a word. But the word was full of hope. Now, they needed the hope because of the problem they created by their idolatry. But he says, I want you to tell my army that's been defeated, you will rise again. You will live again. Now, I know you don't know how. I know you can't fix it. That's why you're now listening to the word of the Lord. So I want you to speak into their deadness, dryness, these words. You will live again. The corpses have a future. So I want to say to you here today in a dry situation, you have a future. As dead and dry as your situation appears to be, you have a future. But it won't come from politics or programs. It'll come from the Lord. When he spoke the word of hope, there's still dry bones, but something happened. He said, I'm going to put sinews on you and make your flesh grow back and cover your skin and Verse 7 says, when I prophesied, 
there was a noise. Click, 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 click. There was a rattling. And bones came together, bone to bone. Mm. Okay, well, now stay with me here. He's just prophesied. All he's done is preach the prophetic word, but that started to, to shake things up a little bit. That started to disturb things. Things started rattling. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. That, the, the bones started rattling. Something happened when a prophetic word was spoken into the situation. We don't just need general preaching today. We in too big a mess for that. We need the prophetic word spoken into the situation so the bones can rattle. Noise. The bones wanted to come together. One of the great missions of the evil one is to keep the saints disconnected. Keep the bones from connecting. Keep the saints disunified over the foolishness of race, culture, class, and gender abuse and to keep us distinct from each other. But he said when the prophetic word came forth, stuff started to come together. I heard a noise. There was a rattling. There was a shaking. But only when stuff had gotten so bad that they had been dry for a long time. We've been dry long enough. There's a problem, verse 8. Even though stuff was rattling, there was no breath in them. They were anatomically organized now. The stuff is getting connected but they weren't breathing. There was, no, there was no breath. So they had the word. They're now organized. The bones are connecting. They're getting some muscle and tissue on them, skin. But there's still no life. It is easy to miss this next verse. But it's critical to the story. Verse 9, then he said to me, God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. He tells Ezekiel, talking to the people is not enough. Prophesy to the people and you'll get some rattling. You'll get some folk leaving talking about didn't he preach. I like that sermon. Oh, that made me feel so much better. Because they feel a little hope. They, you'll, 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 you'll get something, but that ain't life yet. That's some rattling, but that's not life. He says, I want you to prophesy to the breath. So Ezekiel was to prophesy in two different directions. One to the bones, and then he was to prophesy to the breath. Well, now, the question on the floor is what exactly is the breath. What, what is this thing? He says in verse 10, I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath came into them and they came to life and stood on their feet. An exceedingly great army. Wow. What is the breath? Verse 14, I will put my spirit within you. The Hebrew word for breath is ruach. Ruach 
refers to the life pulsating work of the Holy Spirit. You know, when God created, it said the Spirit of God hovered over the earth and things began to live again. The earth was without form and void. It had stuff but didn't have order and it didn't have life. And it says as soon as the Holy Spirit started hovering over it, stuff became alive again. And now you're getting fish and animals and you're, you're getting life. He says, watch this, prophesy to the breath. Preach to the people, the dead bones, but then prophesy. The reason why we are not alive is the spirit is missing. Even if you have the word. Ah. If all you have is the Bible, you have enough for rattling, not enough for living. Let me say it again. If all you have is the word, you have enough for rattling. I love the way John 6.63 says, it says, and the spirit gives life. But when the word connects with the spirit, things begin to live again that look like they could never, ever function again. And not only did they live, they became an exceedingly great army. What does an army do? Fight. You know what Christians have been doing? Retreating. The reason why we're in this mess is because we were a retreating army. Huge army. Everybody loving Jesus. Retreating to the church and abandoning the culture to the devil. It is always, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, he says, but you all with unveiled face, he says, coming into his presence and when you do, you look into the mirror of his word and then the spirit takes over transforming you. You must have both. Now, let me make all of us feel a little bad now. If you just show up for the sermon, all you'll get is a rattle. Maybe. If it's a prophetic word for you. You will never get transformation from a sermon. A sermon is foundational. A sermon, he tells them, prophesy the word first. Look, you can have a refrigerator, stove, can opener, toaster. That's anatomically correct. But without it being plugged into electricity, it has no life. You may have a manual that will explain all the exegetical elements of how this thing ought to work. You may read the instructions and say, amen, hallelujah, praise God for how the toaster works. You could spend all day in front of the book with the toaster. But without electricity, it will not live to pop up toast to keep food cold or to cook it. It needs a life-giving source. He says, prophesy to the spirit. Well, wait a minute, Why? wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm confused. Why does the spirit need prophecy? I don't understand. The spirit, and, 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 and he says, and I like this, he says, from the four winds. Okay, when the Bible talks about four winds, it's talking about each, each like corner of the earth. Uh, Ezekiel said, how are these bones going to live again? Uh, God asked Ezekiel. Ezekiel said, I don't know. But the reason why you don't have to have the answer is because God's got locations he can come from in any direction from, 
you know, over here, over here, over here, over here. He can come from any direction. He says, and the four winds closed in on it. That means it, it was coming from any direction. I don't know how God's going to fix this. I don't know how God's going to fix you. I don't know how God's going to fix me. I don't know how God's going to fix us. All I know is he has access to the whole kit and caboodle. And because he's got access to the whole kit and caboodle, you don't have to be able to figure out how, when, where. You just have to make sure you've given up your idolatry and you're listening to the prophetic word. The reason he tells him to prophesy to the spirit, which is the breath, is because in the Bible, Jesus says the spirit is the spirit of truth. In other words, the spirit will only respond to the truth. We don't get this. The Holy Spirit, which is the life-giving source, will only respond to the truth. If it is not the truth, meaning based on God's word, he will not respond. When you mix human opinion with the truth, he will not respond. God told him in John chapter 5, he said, you search the scriptures, you read your Bible, but you don't have life because you don't have relationship with me. Unless you are spiritually in contact, prophesy, but what am I prophesying to the spirit? I'm prophesying to the spirit about the bones. So wait a minute, I'm telling the folks what God said about the bones, but now I'm turning up and telling the Holy Spirit what he said about the bones. So I'm telling folk what God said, I'm telling the Spirit what God said, and the reason I'm telling them both is because he's the Spirit of truth. And when the Spirit hears and sees I'm functioning on the truth, then the Spirit is free to operate in my situation. I just plugged in to the electricity. Reading your Bible, learning your Bible, studying your Bible is key, but it won't give you life. It'll make you rattle. It'll, 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 show you, it'll get you going a little bit, but it won't breathe life. He says, the breath, the wind's got to blow. You know the best thing you can do? Is tell God what he said. Forgive the way this sounds, but hold God hostage to his word. Yeah. Prophesy to the spirit. Holy Spirit, this is what God said. You said this, and these are my bones situation. So I'm bringing this up to you so your spirit can link with the word. So, let's look at this picture as we come to a conclusion. Say to them, verse 12, thus said the Lord, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. In other words, I'm going to bring you back to what you lost. Why are you going to do this? Why, why will you do this? We, we've, been, we, we've, we've, we've forsaken you. We've abandoned you. We've not repented. We've done gone our own way. Do you mean as long as we've been doing our own thing, you still going to let us live again? Why are you going to do that? Look at what he says twice. Verse 13. Then you will know that I am the Lord. End of verse 14. Then you will know that I am the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. God will let us get so low when we have been in rebellion against him that only he can fix it. There'll be no humans getting the credit. There'll be no program getting the credit. You're going to know it's me because you buried. you in your grave. I am the God of resurrection. I'm going to bring you out of your grave. 
And not only am I going to bring you, I, I wait, uh, Jeremiah 29 says it, you know, I have a plan for you, says the Lord, a plan for your well-being and not for your calamity, to give you a future, to give you a hope. And then he says, then you will seek me and then you will look for me. Then you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Then he comes to verse 14 and says, and I will restore your fortune. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to reconstitute this thing. If you've ever been to a pizzeria, I'm talking about one run by the Italians. I'm talking about a real pizzeria. Okay? I'm talking about one where they, you see them cooking and fixing it from scratch. And they got this wad of dough, and then they begin to abuse it. And they got this wad of dough, and then take it and slam it down. Bam! Take a pin. Be rolling all over it. Just, just, just rolling. Just, just flattening it out. Then at them real pizzeria, they'll spin it on their finger. They'll be spinning the thing. Well, no, I want the good stuff. I want the sausage and the pepperoni, yeah, and the bacon <laughs> and the cheese. I, I mean, I, I want the real thing. I want the real thing. But you see, you can't get the real thing until the dough has been made ready to receive it. And the dough ain't ready until it's been reduced to dependency. He says, and then you will know. I'm God, I did this. Because maybe when you get this low for this long and you find out it's only me, maybe you won't leave me next time. Maybe you won't abandon me next time. Maybe next time you won't kick me to the curb because you want to be accepted by the culture. Maybe next time when the culture wants to subvert you, you say, I ain't going there no more because I didn't been to the valley once. And I don't want to go to the valley again. So, when I was... Uh, When I was growing up, what I did on many Saturdays would go to the Lafayette Bowling Alley. Lafayette Bowling Alley was located a couple of miles from my house, and that was duck pin bowling. Now, you hardly see that anymore. For those of you old schoolers will remember duck pin bowling. The, this was small, the small ball, not the one you put your three fingers in. This is one you held in one hand. And you did regular bowling, but it wasn't the sophisticated bowling we know today. And it was called duck pin because of the small ball that you would use. Well, back then, bowling wasn't sophisticated like it is now. The technology was not as it is now. So when you rolled and knocked down the pins, the technology was so bad, it often would not be able to pick up all the pins that had been knocked down. So at the Lafayette Bowling Alley, when I was growing up, there was a man behind each of the alleys who would walk from lane to lane, picking up pins that had been knocked over that the equipment didn't get. Now, you never saw this guy's face. I never knew who this was. You saw his feet. And all he did was go from lane to lane to lane to lane, picking up pins that had been knocked over, that the machinery didn't get. Never knew who he was. All I knew is he was able to take something that had been rolled over and set it up right again. If you feel like your life has been rolled over by your circumstances and there is no hope. If you feel like things have gone to pot and they can't get better. I can't tell you what he looks like. But I do know somebody who can go from life to life, family to family, church to church, culture to culture, and he knows how to take things that have been knocked over and set them up right again. So don't you quit. Don't you give up. Don't you throw in the towel. 
And why can you keep going even though life has knocked you over? You can keep going so that you will know that he alone is the Lord God of your circumstances. And with that in mind, we want to take a moment to give him some praise. To give him some praise right where he is, right where you are. I want to invite you right where you are to let the Lord know that he's your hope. You can tell him, Lord, only you know. I don't know how this situation can change, whatever it is. I don't know how you can make me an exceedingly great soldier in your army. I don't know. All I know is I'm going to go to your prophetic word and I'm going to place that word in your presence through my worship that the spirit of God will connect with the word so that I can live again. I want to live again. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. So, Lord, we say thanks. Let me give you a moment just to spend a moment with the Lord. Lord, here we are, broken, beaten, disjointed, and at varying levels, hopeless. But you told the prophet to say, these bones will live again. So we're believing your word, and we're going to throw your word back up in your face. Lord, we've preached your word, and we've spoken to many situations, but... I now speak to the breath, to the spirit. Spirit, did you see what God said? He said these bones will live again. Your church will live again. This relationship will live again. This hope will live again. Your word said that. So breathe on us as we worship, as we adore you, as we celebrate you. Receive us, Lord, as we eat this bread. You shed your blood so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. We follow Christ this week. You are our Lord. We drink together. Bless your name, Lord. And may these dry bones live again. Your church, your exceedingly great army. We don't know how, but we do know who. In Jesus' name, amen.